Welcome to High Lawn Baptist Church in St. Albans, West Virginia, where our mission is to know Christ and to make Christ known. For more information, visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. We're so glad you've decided to join us, and now we invite you to grab your Bible, if you're able, as we pray that you will be blessed by the preaching of the truth of God's Word today. We are blessed this morning to have with us um, not only the head of one of the larger Christian outreach programs in not only St. Albans, but I think the state of West Virginia at this point, um, Community Bridge, but we also have a, a guest pastor with us. He is the minister at Kings River, and he's also been a fierce friend of mine during my time as the president of the St. Albans Ministry Alliance. And one of the things that I shared downstairs that I'll share with you now, over the course of just the past two years, it has been fantastic to see this ministry explode and become such a vital part of the community and equipping those who are in poverty to get out of poverty. Please join me in welcoming Brother Chris Kimbrough. Chris Kimbrough. Hey, it is, a, it is certainly an, an honor and a privilege to be here with you guys today, just to take a couple of moments to share with you. Uh, as, he, as he shared, I am the pastor of Kings River Worship Center, so this morning, yeah, October is our missions month as well, and I have a guest speaker there today that is speaking, so I wanted to share with you guys for a few moments, and then I've got to be back over there to kind of finish up our service. Uh, but today, Community Bridge, what is this? Um, really, Community Bridge was put in place a number of years ago when a bunch of churches in St. Albans came together to be able to help families in need, basically to bless children before they went to school. If you remember several years ago, there were backpack giveaways to took place, that took place on the old Kmart parking lot before school started. We would do free haircuts for kids. Churches would come and youth groups would do, they would have puppet displays. They would do dramas, human videos, and skits. And we would give away backpacks to kids before they went back to school. That was not one church in the community, but it was a numerous churches working together. And we created a fund called Community Bridge that we did that through to where it wasn't one church, but it was all of us as the body of Christ. That happened for a number of years and then just kind of fizzled out. And we just kind of left that stuff in place, even though nothing was happening for years. So in January of last year, when some people came to me with cases of clothing and said, we want to be able to help foster children, we want to give this to you. If you want to give this to families that have foster kids, you can have it. And so we stepped back and said, well, wait a minute. Kings River can't fix, the, can't do everything for foster. And also at the same time, we had people that were reaching out into Tent City in St. Albans. And we said, Kings River can't fix the homeless issue in St. Albans either. For that to happen and for us to really make a difference, it's going to take the body of Christ coming together and all the churches working together as one to impact our community. So we put everything under Community Bridge and we said, let's invite all the churches to be part of this. Let's all do it together. Well, so we started in January with a 435 square foot closet to help just foster children. In 22 months, we've now built an 8,000 square foot facility to dedicate to this. We have more stuff than we know what to do with. And we have 104, 104 churches, community organizations, businesses, recovery houses, hospitals that have all partnered together. Only God can do this. But to tell you just a little bit about it, here, here's the real fun part. Let me just tell you for a few minutes. Let me, let me not talk about me. Let me not talk about Community Bridge. Let's talk about some people this morning. Let's hear some stories of some things God has done. Let me tell you just for a moment about Wendy Jo. Wendy Jo is a woman that um, her and her husband had were steeped in addiction living in the community, and they had reached the point where they lost their son, and they were living homeless. They were living in a tent out in the woods. Wendy Jo and her husband ended up going into recovery to try to get their lives back in order. They went through a recovery program, which is called Shirley Temple Housing. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. Shirley Temple is a recovery program in the Canal Valley with 13 houses, a couple in St. Albans and many in Charleston. So Wendy Jo and her husband go through recovery to get off the substances they're on. Now they're ready to transition into a home to get their lives back in order. 
They don't have anything. Shirley Temple Housing calls Community Bridge and says, hey, here's the situation. Can you all help? So we make contact with Wendy Jo and we start to learn her story and we learn that her and her husband don't even know what we mean when we say household items. What, what are those, she says. So we send someone to her house. They've got a place to live. They don't have anything in it. And we meet with them and say, just to see what they need and how we can help. And through that, we start building a relationship. So we end up taking a bed for her son to set up a bedroom, believing that her son was going to live in that room. We set up beds for her and her husband. We got them dressers. We set up recliners and chairs for them to help them set up household. Through that, we shared with them about a recovery program, a 12-step program at Community Bridge. Now let's get some people around them to continue to support them. So Wendy Jo decides to start coming, her and her husband, they start coming into the recovery, coming in and setting and getting to know people. In several weeks, Wendy Jo and her husband say, wait a minute, these people love us. Let's go to church and see what it's really like. They come in the door and they come to church. Through that, they start coming every single week. We ended up walking with her through the court system to get custody of her son back. She sends pictures of her son in his new bedroom, and he says that's the first bed that he's actually owned that was his bed. We got to watch Wendy Jo send her son to church camp. We got to help send him to church camp this summer to let him have a, a, a church camp experience for the very first time. We're now actually teaching Wendy Jo how to cook to help her be able to take care of her family because she hasn't been, never been taught this in her life, so we're walking through her with this. This is what discipleship looks like. This is what making a difference in our community looks like. It takes all of us together. Let me share with you a story about a woman that lives, um, she lives actually off of Canal Terrace. She lives right down the road from here. She's a single woman who uh, a couple of years ago, she really, her house was empty and she was lonely and she'd heard all this about fostering children and she thinks, okay, let, let me be part of this. I want to do the process. So she goes through the classes to be a foster parent and she ends up taking placement of a teenage girl in this community who, because of her family situation, her mother's addiction, the state had removed her from a home and she needed a safe place to go. So they placed her in this house living right down the road. So as months progressed, we got to be able to help her. We set up a bed so she could take placement of this young lady. We got her a bed. We set up a bedroom so she could actually have a child in her house. Well, as months progressed, the court system ended up terminating the mother's parental rights and the mother just basically gave her daughter up. This woman that took this daughter, this girl in, she was going, I can't have this. Uh, she's become part of my family. So she goes through the process and she adopts her. And she adopts this young lady to let her be her daughter. So we progress on several more months. We get down the road. Her home is settled. She decides, you know what? I'll do this again. Let's, let me foster another girl. Let me take another girl. She's not looking for a baby. She's saying, I'll take teenagers, the ones that nobody wants. So she takes in another teenager in this community. This girl comes in with quite a bit of baggage. A little bit of a handful, to be honest with you. She comes in. She's already been in 14 different foster homes. She comes in, and we, we start working with her. We give her a bed. We set up for her to have a place. We start helping her, start encouraging this foster mom of how to, how to make it and how to survive here. So we walk with her through it, and this girl says, well, I've been 14 places. How, many, how long are you going to keep me? How long am I going to stay here? This woman has decided, no, I can't have this. I'm not going to be another one on her list. She's now going through the process to adopt her to where this doesn't happen to her anymore. So now this young lady, her, she's had a gas leak. She's had a gas leak. Her gas has been shut off, and the gas company is telling her, you've got to be able to fix that. It's on your property first. So she, gets, she's a, works, she lives on a very low income. She... she has a car, she's making car payments on, so she tries to get everything in place to fix the gas leak. She gets behind on the car payment. The car's just recently been repossessed. Does she get money from the state for those girls? Yes, but if you want to live, we're trying to make ends meet in this day and time. It's kind of hard. So now we're walking through her the process. We got her ride, take her church this morning, and we're going through the process to help her get everything back in place because we want these two girls to stay safe in that home. It's about us all being community together. I've got countless stories of the amazing things that we've watched happen and the stories and the amazing things we've watched happen in this community when all the churches come together. What do we do? We help foster families. We help children in need. We work with school systems. We work with recovery programs. We've partnered with 104 different churches and agencies in this valley to provide for needs. 
We've partnered with Christian Appalachian Project in Kentucky, and we get semi-truckloads of stuff to be able to bless our community with. And we're just watching what God can do. This is not what we can do because any one of us together, we can't handle this and we can't meet the needs. But all of us together, being the body of Christ, can make an incredible impact in this community. In our state alone, in the month of, Jan- in the month of January, the statistics were there were over 6,500 foster children in the state of West Virginia. 817 of them were in Kanawha County. The second highest county behind us was Cabell County with about 340, actually I've got the number, 356 of them were in Cabell County. Wow, Kanawha County is over two times more than the second highest county in the state. Kanawha County also leads in the opioid epidemic and the drug in the overdose rate resulting in death. We, re, we are. This plagues our community. It plagues St. Albans. It plagues Charleston, Cross Lanes, Nitro. It's everywhere. It's probably in your neighborhood. What do we do as the body of Christ? We have to get out of our walls and make a difference in our community and be the body of Christ we're called to be. So Community Bridge, here's the visual of it. Jesus Christ is the foundation of everything, but we're a two-way bridge. We're loving people out of their situation by whatever means necessary. If that's clothing, if that's bedding, if that's a recovery program, if that's a cooking class. We're building relationships with them to get them out of their situation. Let's get them into the kingdom of God. It's also a two-way bridge. We're a bridge that exists to love people out of the walls of the church because every church in every city, in every state, are full of people that love God and love their community. But they feel like they can't relate, they don't have anything to offer, and they're scared. And we're saying we're a bridge that says, come with us, let's get you, let's show you something simple you can do to make a difference in your community. Every bridge has two piers that hold and support the weight of that bridge. This one's the same. One of those pillars is all the churches working together because guess what? St. Paul Missionary Baptist can't support the weight of this. Kings River can't. Maranatha can't. Highland Baptist can't. It takes all the churches as the body of Christ supporting this. The other one is the community at large. It's the DHHRs. It's the school systems. It's the businesses in the community. It's all of us together working together to make a difference. So we're watching God do absolutely amazing things, and we want you all to know and say thank you for being part of it because this church is on our list. You all have been part of it. You've helped, and you all provided clothing that I picked up this week to help make this all possible. And any need that you have in the community, you have a resource because you already have it at your fingertips. Go out and love this community, and let's all work together as the body of Christ to make an amazing difference. We have a newsletter that um, we've started publishing a newsletter. This is Robin. She's here with me today. She helps us with a newsletter, and she's going to go around and just kind of give every family. We'd like to give you a copy of the newsletter just so you can see. And there's a phone number in there that you can call if you like more information or if you want to come see this in person. If you, talk, if you go down 817 and you look off the side and you see a gray building with a blue roof that's being built uh, where Economy Tank building used to be, that is the Community Bridge building that we are in the process of setting in motion to be a facility to basically love the community where all churches can work together to say, let's make a difference. Because we, Jesus Christ is the answer. Another government program is not the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. And how does he operate? Through his church. We're the ones that he uses. So we've said that we as a body are not going to pray, God intervene in the opioid epidemic. God intervene in the foster situations. We're saying, God, we are available. Use us to make a difference. Because how does God work? He works through people. And he'll use every single one of us to make a difference. So thank you for just a few moments to be able to share. Just share our heart. Uh, Feel free to stop by. Give us a call. You want to see it. You want more information. We'll be glad to give it to you. So. As we're continuing in Missions Week, I wanted to focus, actually I I felt led to focus on what missions actually entail. And there are a couple of key concepts that we need to get under wraps before we go any further. First of all, the ministry of missions is the ministry of love. It is the way that we proclaim the three basic commandments, the three great commandments 
that Christ gave to us, two of which he quotes from the Old Testament. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. Second, like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. And the third one that he gave during communion when he said, commandment with a promise, love one another as I have loved you. And they will know you are my disciples. That's a key phrase that I want you to bear in mind. They will know that you are my disciples if you love one another, if they see that love put into action. Last week we talked about the ministry of showing love, what we call missions. That's our ministry to the suffering in a fallen world. Today we're talking about the ministry of proclaiming love, the ministry of evangelism, or our ministry to the lost. They're not the same thing, even though they are closely intertwined. Missions ministry is the way that we love our neighbors as ourselves, the way that we're commanded to, especially those that are falling on hard times, the suffering, those who are hungry, those who are persecuted, those who are living check to check, or or in some cases are homeless. The way that we feed the needs of our community because we are living in a fallen world and they need the hope and the comfort that only the people of Christ can provide. But once they are recipients of that love, that love has an impact, which is what we're going to be talking about today. What do we do to answer that impact, the questions that that love raises? Because Christian love is not normal. Christian love is not usual. The love that we are inspired to exhibit as Christians is far and away different than what you would get from someone who is a non-Christian. And when they see that agape, self-sacrificing love, that dedicated love that only God can provide through the body of Christ, they note that difference, and that difference inspires a question. What makes you different? Why do you love me? How can I have that difference too. We'll talk about that in just a second. If you would take out your copy of God's Word with me and turn to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And we're going to talk a little bit about a... This is one of those stories that normally gets kind of glossed over as a curiosity of the disciples. But I want to kind of focus in on what the background of the situation was and how this was actually a pretty harrowing experience, potentially, for the people involved. But before we get into God's Word, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer really quickly. Heavenly Father, please use Your Word now to inspire us to be bold in exhibiting Your love before others and to be bolder still in proclaiming what that love means to be prepared to give an account of the hope that is within us so that through our words, through our actions, Lord, that we might be fruitful and that those who are potential brothers and sisters in Christ might become fully part of His body and His church. So open our hearts and our minds now to Your service as we seek to dine dine extravagantly from the table of your word, as we commit this time and ourselves into your hands without any reservation. For it is in the matchless name of Christ we pray. And all God's people say, Acts 8, starting with uh, verse 26. Acts 8, 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, incidentally the deacon Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of the Kandike, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was sitting in the chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. 
This is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they, became, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all of your heart, underline this in your copy of God's Word. If you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again. But he went on his way, what? Rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared to Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in the towns until he reached Caesarea. And this is unfortunately where, where Philip the deacon leaves the active ministerial record of the Bible. He's mentioned in a couple of other places where he offers hospitality to Paul, but this is as much as that we get from his own ministry and what a ministry it was. Now, there are a few things that we need to talk about in this background scene that we don't ordinarily talk about. First of all, this was not Philip's comfort zone. The Ethiopian eunuch that we're talking about here was a royal official. He was someone who was directly responsible to the queen of the Ethiopian empire. Now, we have a bad habit of thinking about Ethiopia today as a nation that's embroiled in poverty, the one that doesn't really make much of a difference. But in this day and time, it was strong enough to rival Rome. It was strong enough to, to hold off Egypt for thousands of years. And it had a large Jewish community living within it. A Jewish community that very much looked like the Pharisees that Jesus had preached against for so often. So this is someone who was an aristocrat, someone who held high office, someone who was in command of many people. He was on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which means he was a believing Jew. He was a proselyte, someone that was Jewish by religion, taken from another race of men. Of men. <clears throat> he had supposedly received this scroll of Isaiah, a precious and lavish gift from the temple itself. Remember what has happened before this part of, of Acts. Remember that Christ has only recently risen from the grave. Remember that the church has just recently formed and they are under the bitter persecution of the Jewish authority of the day. And this is a guy who's just come from the temple. He is someone who received a gift from the scribes that called out, Let Jesus be crucified. And he was returning to Ethiopia by a caravan, meaning that he was surrounded by a contingent of soldiers. We heard in the scripture how he had to command someone to stop his chariot. So this is what Philip is facing. He's not just facing someone who's curious about the scriptures. He's facing someone who's in league with the enemy. He's facing someone who has soldiers at his beck and call. He's facing someone that has a good deal of power in his own right. Someone who could very easily say, you're a heretic, let him die. And then we look at Philip. We're not talking about the apostle here. We're talking about a deacon, diaconus, a servant of the church. This is not a position of authority. This is a position of service. He was a disciple of the disciples. He was not well educated the way that this Ethiopian eunuch would have been at court. He was someone that was mentored into the faith by the apostles of Christ. He was someone who was commissioned because the Hellenistic Jews that were under the care of the church 
weren't being fed and taken care of the same way as the native-born Israelite Jews were. So he was commissioned to be a peacemaker between two roaring factions. To his credit, it means that he had to be empathetic. He had to be somebody that could talk and could listen. He was a caretaker of widows and orphans. He was not a preacher, so to speak. He was not one of the apostles. He was not someone who had a bunch of degrees or letters after his name. He was an average person whose job it was to be of humble service before God. Nevertheless, before this scene in the book of Acts, he was called to be a minister to the Samaritans, people that he, from his own background, considered subhuman. He was an emissary to the enemies of Israel, whose job it was now was to tell them not only about the Jewish God, but the Jewish Messiah. So he didn't have a lot of credentials to face this Ethiopian eunuch. This was a frightening conversation, well outside of what should have been his comfort zone. Nevertheless, the Holy Spirit asked him to do something, and he did it. So this is the situation. You have someone mentored versus someone who is extremely well-educated. Someone who is powerless, who's confronting the powerful. Someone with no weapons to his name whatsoever, facing an army. Someone who is a Christian, facing a devout Jew. Someone who would have been trained by the Pharisees that condemned Christ to death. Someone who was very humble in their own right, facing someone who was proud and haughty. Now, we think of a conversation about somebody inviting them to church as being awkward. How do you think this played out? If Philip had the same human mindset that most of us do when we confront an unbeliever, would this scene have been able to happen? What we're talking about here is an extreme case of obedience. Philip was the unlikely evangelist. Philip was someone who, if, if, if a lot of us were in issues, we would have said, I'm sorry, God. Please find someone else. But Philip had a few things going for him, nevertheless. The difference between what the world, and by extension, what we consider impossible and what actually is possible, is a total reliance upon God for everything. Write this down. The difference between what the world in its wisdom, or lack thereof, considers impossible, and what is actually possible, is a total reliance on God. The God that we know is faithful. If God leads you into a situation, no matter what the optics of that situation looks like, if God leads you to confront somebody to bring them into the family of God, God will equip you to see it happen. He will not lead us into a situation on our He will supply. Paul writes to us about this, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. You're not the difference. No matter how many letters you might have behind your name, no matter how many seminary classes you may have had, that's not what's important here. You have been saved by grace, unmerited love. There's nothing you can do to earn the love of God. The only reason that God loves you is because He loves you. You can't earn grace by definition. Nevertheless, it's given to you. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works. Nothing you can do so that no one could boast. In other words, if you were saved because you did something, then by boasting about it, you'd sin and you'd be unsaved and the whole sick, twisted cycle would have to repeat. But by giving and be, be receiving the gift of God, that is something that He Himself takes responsibility for. He takes responsibility for your salvation. He takes responsibility for your mission. He takes responsibility for your ministry. And every conversation, write this down, every conversation that you have with somebody who is an unbeliever, God Himself takes responsibility for. We are God's handiwork, created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
So what can we glean from Paul's words? First of all, God from the foundations of the world already knew past, present, and future everything that was going to happen, no matter what time, no matter what place, no matter what person. So before the foundation of the world was laid, your entire life was mapped out before God holding nothing back. Which means that every time you come in contact with somebody who is an unbeliever or somebody who is in desperate need of God's love, it could be a brother or sister in Christ, no matter what that conversation is, this was a divinely led appointment that was scheduled for you from eternity past. So God's already prearranged that encounter. God is already aware of any problems that you might face. Whether you're like me and have some severe problems remembering your Bible verses, or you're just a, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, an introverted person, no matter what the circumstances, God knows about it, and God's also equipped you, prepared a way past all of those problems. There is no problem that you can encounter that God has not already foreseen, has planned for, and has equipped you to overcome. Amen? The Apostle John, through the voice of Christ, writes to us, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, this is your provision. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit of God, who the Father will send in my name, will teach you some things, occasional things, some trivia so you can get through Jeopardy. He will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have commanded you. And also he gives us this extra promise, the peace I leave with you. My peace, the peace of God, the peace of Christ, the same peace that sustained him from the Garden of Gethsemane to the cross. My peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives, a peace built on happenstance. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The most common commandment in all of Scripture, fear not. Why? Because the peace of God that passes all understanding is with you, in you, and upon you will sustain you through all things. No matter the encounter, no matter the mission, no matter the challenge, no matter what the enemy has tried to cook up to derail you, God has already supplied. And He will keep you going. There is no challenge that God will lead you to that He has not already purchased your victory for. God assumes the responsibility for everything you do, you say, you think. The question is, are we obedient to it? When we reach that divinely gifted appointment, when we reach that opportunity to make a positive difference in somebody's life, when we stand before that somebody who desperately needs a touch of the Master's hand, everything that is equipped for you to have a good visit is already laid out before you. All you have to do is say yes. That's it. The Spirit directs, teaches, and reminds you of all of these things. This is the gift of God as we hear from the point of conversion, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption, meaning that you are not walking alone. You are never, ever alone. You are always equipped by God, no matter what the challenge may be. And to supplement that as well, the peace of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, is always upon you as long as you rely on Him and not yourself. How many times? Oh, the peace we often forfeit. Oh, the needless pain we bear just because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. That glorious old song that reminds us that it's when we go to the situation without God that we fall into problems. But whenever we do, knowing and relying wholly upon Him, Christ Himself said, you will be responsible for miracles greater than anything you've seen me do. That's a promise of God. You can do wonders. All you have to do is believe. Be obedient. Be reliant upon Him. The great commission that we've all been given. Another example of a commandment with a promise. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even into the very end of the age, in this translation, to the very end of the world in others. 
Go do your job. How do we make more Christians? By being a Christian. What does a Christian do? We love God with everything we are. That's first. Love Him above all else. Secondly, like unto it, love everybody made in His image. Both our fellow Christians and everybody who is a potential Christian. And make sure, number three, we love one another. And when people see that difference, especially when people are the recipient of missions work, that's what softens the heart of stone. Many people who have been hurt by churches, if you love on them long enough, all the resentment that they've built in over those years, that melts away. Love is our first and greatest weapon. Love is the way that we soften a heart of stone so that when they ask us, number one, to come back into the body of Christ, come back into the family of God, and number two as well, what, uh, what can I do to be like you? Loving them is what destroys that resistance. And the answer to their question is a very simple answer. A very simple answer. The confession of the Ethiopian eunuch is an example. I believe that Jesus Christ is what? The Son of God. This is a faith born from the Holy Spirit of God. This is something that's already ready to kindle in somebody's heart. Faith cometh by hearing and the hearing of the the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. This is an awesome memory verse that I highly encourage you to keep in your arsenal. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. And this is how the Ethiopian eunuch uh, came to be converted. He was reading the Word of God. He wasn't in possession of the Holy Spirit, so he couldn't fully understand the Word of God. But a man of God with an, a divinely scheduled appointment, came up to him, explained the plan of salvation to him, despite all the challenges. And through the courage that God had offered him, even though he was a nobody, speaking to a somebody, through the courage that God had given him, the Word of God suddenly bore a new name in the Lamb's Book of Life. The Word of God has an impact. Here's another case. Proclaiming the Word of God, living out the Word of God. Matthew 25, The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or, or need clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Then the king will reply, truly I say to you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you've also done for me. Simple acts of Christian kindness break through a heart of stone. And through a combination of having the Word of God at our disposal and having the love of God exhibiting for others to see, these questions start to ignite in an unbeliever's heart. What, why do you believe what you believe? That's basically been the hallmark of my ministry since I first came here. Make sure that you understand not only what you believe, but why you believe it. That was the case of the Ethiopian eunuch. And in the case of the people that the king is talking about here who were brought into the kingdom through acts of kindness, why do you love me? I'm a nobody! I'm poor! I'm wretched! I'm hungry! I'm naked! I'm ashamed! I'm a prisoner! I'm sick! 
I'm unworthy of love in the eyes of this world. I have nothing that I could offer anybody. Yet you feed me, you clothe me, you visit me, you comfort me. You provide for me to give me a pathway out of poverty to, to assume upon a station of life. Why do you love me when no one else does? That's how we make an impact. This is why the king rewards the faithful. Jesus also goes on to say, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. This is a radical notion. This is so far beyond what the world's wisdom says. It's, it's insane. If someone slaps your cheek, turn to them the other one also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to anyone who acts from you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do unto you. That's a positive commandment. A negative commandment is one where Jesus tells you not to do something. Here he's telling you to do something. Do to others. Feed, clothe, be merciful to, forgive. Be ministers of reconciliation actively. Do to others as you would have them do unto you. And if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lead to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. This is how you make a difference to the kingdom of God and please God in your life. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High God because He is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. God wants to offer mercy. Now this doesn't make good business sense. I'll grant you. But this is the Word of God. And at its central point, it is saying basically this. If you want to make a difference in this world, you don't do it by toppling over governments. You don't do it by rigging elections. You don't do it through the power structures of what is. You do it through one way. You love people. You conquer them by turning enemies into friends. One heart at a time. One heart at a time. For it is the will of the Father that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance through Christ Jesus. That difference of not holding a grudge, that difference of forgiving people that wrong you, that difference of rejecting the tunnel vision that we live in right now, where two sides of the aisle won't go near each other, much less listen to each other. The difference of being someone that will cross the aisle to talk, that will listen, that will forgive. The difference that is made when you supply, knowing that someone is too poor to supply back. That raises the question, what makes you different? Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you love me? What makes you so different? In your hearts, Peter tells us, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. This is the Bible's bridge from missions work to evangelism. When the missions work does its job, when the love of God does its job, and the heart of stone is melted, and the person is hungering and thirsting for the things of God, when people are asking you, why are you different? Why do you love me? Why do you believe what you believe? This is Peter's response to those questions. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with what? Gentleness and respect. Don't beat somebody to death with the back of a Bible. 
Don't bludgeon them to death, calling them a sinner and telling them that they're going to burn. Love them, show them, and demonstrate the love of God to them. And when that love has an impact, what makes you different? You can tell them. It's not what, it's who. It's not what. It's who. So we have three tools in our toolbox that we need to sharpen. The question of why do you believe what you believe is simply a matter of evangelism through reason. Talking to somebody, reasoning with them. The question of why do you love me is a question of evangelism through relationships. Not just handing them a sandwich, but talking to them. Developing a relationship with them. Being personally invested in them as a potential brother or sister in Christ. What makes you different? That's evangelism through example. Share the word of God always and where necessary, use words. Live it out. Be doers of the word and not hearer only. Hearers only. The final question, the key question, if you will, is this. Can I have that same difference in my life? Can I have that same difference in my life as well? It's a simple message. We all need forgiveness. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Forgiveness is available. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten that whosoever believeth in should not perish but have everlasting. But it's not automatic. For not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So why? Because it's impossible for sin to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Unless you, excuse me, for the wages of sin is death. So we have to turn. As a regular human being outside of God, we have a focus on the self. We have a focus on sin. It's all about me. The Bible tells us that we have to turn to move from a focus on self to a focus on Christ and Christ alone. The $40 churchy word for that is repentance. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. But when you do, when you repent, when you accept the gift of grace, then you become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. In the here and now, right now. For I have come that they may have life and they have it more abundantly. Love, joy, peace, goodness, faithfulness, patience, self-control, love, joy, and peace. Especially that's something that's yours right now if you're in Christ. You don't have to wait until you're dead. You have it right this second. But you're a citizen of heaven in the hereafter as well. For I go and prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. And the fact that all of you remember those memory verses, that's your own indication of God's faithfulness that the Holy Spirit will give you your answers when you need them. Isn't God wonderful? I'll close out with this. For those of you who have been following on the Revelation study, This is the end of the book. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the streets of gold, the walls of finest gemstone. I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be His people and God Himself will be with them and will be their God. No need for the Son. God Himself will be right there. No night, no darkness, no disease, no hopelessness, no poverty, no weakness. The word goodbye has no meaning there. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. That's enough to make a Baptist shout. This is who we are. 
we have a hope that nothing can take away from us. That nothing on this side of eternity can snatch out of our hands. We have a hope that surpasses any and all expectations that we could possibly ever conceive of. And we have a foretaste of it right now. The peace that passes all understanding. The hope that sees past our here and now and sees into eternity. The joy that sustains us through all of life's circumstances that no matter the hurricane, we can look at it with a defiant smile on our face. And the love of God knowing that wherever we are, He is right there beside us all the way. Take advantage of those opportunities when God gives them to you. Take advantage of those opportunities to tell somebody else, this is why I'm different. That's a difference you can have too. All God's people said, Heavenly Father, we thank you for that hope. We thank you for the life everlasting and the certain knowledge that where you are there, we will all one day be. Lord, for the saints who have gone on before us, we thank you that they are now in your arms and that we will see them all again. Help us to take that certainty, that hope that you've given us, And to be able to tell others that we have a God who will save. Embolden us to this task and strengthen us for the future ahead. That not only would your church grow, but that your family would grow. And if there be any within the sound of my voice that have yet to know you in that certain hope, that have yet to come to know you in that free pardon of sin. And maybe there's another struggle in their life that's causing them to, to look at the here and now versus to see things from your perspective, Lord. If there's something that is struggling on any heart, use this time of invitation that they may know and they may touch the Master's hand and know fully the God who loves them. For it is in the matchless name of Christ we pray. All God's people said. Thank you for joining us at High Lawn Baptist Church. We pray that you were blessed by today's message. At High Lawn, we believe that when you love God, you share His Word. When you love others, you spread the gospel. We would love for you to join us next time, and if possible, to join us in person. To contact or learn more about us, to donate to our ongoing ministry, or most importantly, to learn about the salvation offered to you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, visit us at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Once again, thank you, and God bless you.